My name is David Pincus and I'm a graduate student at UCSF and I get the privilege today to interview my PhD advisor Peter Walter on his uh, scientific and extra scientific hobbies and creative endeavors. So hi Peter. Hi David. Nice to I see think you. you should be in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I'm glad you find other uh, uses of your time. Yeah. I'm working on the next paper. It'll be out soon. So um, I want to start basically by um, introducing what you do, which is mostly science, but a little bit on the side, getting to do creative projects with your hands, doing woodworking and metalworking, doing sculpture and functional stuff around the house. So how did you get your start doing uh, wood and metalworking? Well, it basically started uh, when I was growing up. When we, I always loved to do little projects and uh, I did a lot of, uh, um, sort of handiwork with my dad. Um, we had a little room in our apartment in Berlin um, that, that was really, really the tiniest room in, in, in the apartment, so maybe six feet or eight feet or something. Um, and we used it to, to just do all sorts of projects. It was a room that was okay to make a mess and to leave projects half finished stand around and I just I just love creating things with my hands. Well how'd you get your start doing science? But actually started with my dad as well when he had a little uh, chemist shop in Berlin and uh, they were selling all sorts of uh, herbs and chemicals and soaps and stuff um, and I got fascinated by the chemistry of, of uh, um, sort of mixing things together making them explode Take an oxidant, a reductant, you can create amazing things. Um, so it was the pyrotechnical um, aspects of chemistry that really got me excited as a young boy. Have you ever had a, an idea, does your mind ever wander to science when you're actually you know, crafting something? Of course, yeah, yeah. And those two are clearly not separate. And, and, and often in, in, in building things, uh, repetitive tasks, and you, you sit there for hours sanding something, and that time is, is not wasted. Your neurons are firing left and right, and you put other things together. So it's a very relaxing exercise. So I think having some, a passion that you can pursue outside of the lab is really important for keeping yourself focused on science. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when, when we were living in New York, um, I did a lot of photography simply because the surroundings are, are you know, beautiful things you can photograph in New York. Um, and I, but, but when I worked in the lab myself, I uh, had a lot of manual satisfaction by doing experiments. And I really loved the detective work of, of uh, designing experiments and tickling out the last little secret out of Mother Nature. Um, and that is uh, now that, that the lab has grown and uh, I'm basically not on the bench anymore. I sit all day in the computer. I, I, I talk to people. So, so I think I've uh, fulfilled that need and, and provide balance um, between the ex intellectual exercise and doing something with your hand. Both sides um, uh, benefit from, from that creative, from having creative outlets. So you have a wonderful shop here in your house. How did, how did that get started? What was your first uh, piece of equipment that you had here and how has it taken shape and evolved over the years? Well, let me step back one, one, one step further. I mean, when I came to um, the, the States, I spent six years in Manhattan, and we were basically living in a little box. So, so this, this kind of uh, art form of, of uh, doing woodworking um, was completely out of the question um, because you just couldn't, you didn't have the space where, where you could make woodworking so dirty. It's a dirty exercise. Mm -hmm. So when we moved to San Francisco, um, the, 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 we had th three requirements um, for, for a house. We wanted a fireplace, we wanted a garden, and I wanted a garage. Um, and the garage basically turned into a wood shop. We evicted the car, and the car is now in the driveway. Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, built a little, a little wood shop and, and, and bought a lot of um, used equipment that eventually um, got a bit more fancy and a complete set of, of doing things. So, so I've never took any formal training in cabinet making. It, it's all trial and error, lots of error. I want to ask you about some of the particular specific pieces that you have around the house. Can you talk about the stained glass piece on the, up on the stairs? 
Well, that was a wonderful little project I did uh, together with Patricia, my, my wife. Um, when we moved into the house, we, we, we built this wall in which the, the, the glass window is now. Um, and it looked very ugly just having a wall there, so we tried, decided to penetrate it to, to bring light into both spaces. Um, so we just, it was our, our first and only stained glass piece we, we ever made and we had great fun exploring it and I think it turned out fantastically. What about the, uh, the tree in the bathroom? The tree in the bathroom, well, we, we, we experimented a lot with lighting in the upper floor, so we put the skylights in. And if you have such a nice skylight, um, plants are happy there. Um, so it's a little bit, so the bathroom is designed a little bit um, uh, Japanese architecture in mind, where, where, you, where you find a combination of natural elements and uh, geometric um, elements. So can you tell us about the, this endeavor you have right behind you here, where you looks like you somehow busted through the wall to create a little habitat? Yeah, I grew up in Germany, um, and all this, the houses are stone. Uh, so living here in a wooden house gives you a lot more opportunity. <laughs> so basically what, what we did is a friend of mine, he just took a chainsaw to the wall, and we, we went through, cut this hole, put a little plant window on the outside, and then built this little um, display nook here. And it's, just a, it's just a very warm feature. One of the nice aspects, at least for me being in the lab, is getting to see some of the, the gifts that you craft for our annual holiday party. How did that tradition start? I think it's, it's, it's nice to give something personal rather than, than store-bought. That's uh, generally, I think generally true. It's, it's a nice personal, personal gesture to, to think of a, a present that's, that's befitting the, the person. I've done a number of different things. The thing I'm most proud of is, uh, is a time machine. Again, because it relates so nicely to the science we do. The thing we are, the most precious thing we have is, 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 is our time. And this machine makes more of it. You just take this clock and squeeze it, and out drips time. And then you have a bottle of it to, to use for whatever gives you rewards and satisfaction in life. The fountains in the garden are beautiful. When, what was the order that, that you put them together? And um, can you describe that process? Yeah, the, I, I love flowing water. I mean, it, it's wonderful in, in, uh, in landscape design. I think a wonderful example is the Alhambra in Granada in, in, in Spain. So it's the center of, of Islamic culture. It's a palace with lots of water features left and right, trying to, to, to build some water features into, into our garden. It's very relaxing sitting next to flowing water. The ball fountain, I was at a scientific meeting, um, at a conference in, in Santa Fe, and Tommy Kilkhausen and I went uh, to a gallery, the Stone Forest. And we, they have wonderful carved uh, uh, stone features. So, and then we had a big, uh, uh, big issue because you, you suddenly get this crate with a round stone ball that weighs some thousand pounds and it sits in your garage, in, in your driveway. Then what do you do next? It's, 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 uh, so, so a lot of handling, uh, logistics of, of how to then put it out there in the garden. So I built cranes and carts and, and tracks um, to move it out there. So in part what I love about creating things is to deal with the challenges as they arise, and, and it's a process. The window fountain, again, it, it has a little oriental touch in, in design. Um, it was just sketched, another boring seminar, um, and uh, has very geometric features to it. There's a little pond underneath with our goldfish, and it's, it's, um, it's a third, the, the, the third generation of that glass plate fountain. Um, so the first one was experimental, where we, basically we tried to pump up the water between two glass plates. And it's, it's amazing what eight feet of pressure does to a glass plate. <laughs> so it basically ex exploded uh, when, when we tried to pump the water in there. Um, and then the, the second one was, was better, was, it had copper piping on the side that was hidden inside the wood. 
um, which uh, then blew over in a storm. And this is the third, third version now, and it has a valid stainless steel frame hidden inside the wood. So it looks very delicate, but it's actually quite strong on the inside. I guess it started with woodwork, and now it seems that you're trying your hand at metalwork. So can you describe a little bit about La Monique? Yeah, so La Monique is a, a sculpture that is eventually going to be a fountain. Woodworking is, is a subtractive uh, craft because you take a piece of wood and you carve away from it and then you glue a few things together, but there will always be separate pieces. Whereas metalworking, especially welding, you put things together and you form permanent bonds, so it's synthetic. And I think the two the two are very, they're fundamentally different and you can create things in metal you could never dream of building, building in wood. Uh, expanded uh, range of possibilities one has with it. The ultimate dream is to combine the two. So I want to make kinetic sculptures that look wooden but have metal interiors that, that, that are working and that, that, that the wooden pieces interact in, 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 in ways that are just not possible with that material alone. So how did you get your inspiration for La Monique? I was sitting there doodling um, and sort of my mind was wandering into some geometrical shapes that would make some nice sculpture. Um, I think that were the first sketches that then evolved and uh, basically what she is, she, she's a little square that then uh, expands and then you twist the whole thing and turn it over. Um, and then a couple a couple of months later, I, I, I read a book, um, the, the Day of the Triffid, by John Bintham, um, a science fiction novel written in the 1950s, uh, where, where sort of plant-like creatures start invading the earth, and first they're being cultured as, as these beautiful, exotic um, new plants, and then when everybody has them in their garden, they turn out carnivorous and, and start attacking and eating people. Um, it's a wonder, wonderful little story, um, and it's uh, so. So I thought, well, maybe one can turn her into something like that. So I, I, I tried to make the sculpture more and more organic, looking on uh, superimposed on the on the geometrical design. How does uh, your science and your art? How does these two things sort of inform each other and and influence? Is there an interplay between the two? Well, I mean, I think if, if, if you think uh, what, what, what makes you a great scientist is basically um, doing something well and being creative with what you're doing, going, into, going somewhere out of the box where people haven't been before. Um, because you're basically doing discovery, no idea where we're going. I think in a way, working, working with material and creating something is actually quite similar. I think in both in science and, and, and art, you're never going to be uh, fully rewarded by just doing something uh, technically perfect if it's just derivative of what other people have done.